the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, as it now is, is for all practical purposes the lengthened shadow of William Hayward Pickering. We're about to encounter the planet Mars with a spacecraft built here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Bill Pickering was appointed director of JPL in 1954. He wasn't new to the lab even in 1954. He'd been working here since its establishment in 1944. That was when JPL was working on rocket development for the Army. The Army came to the lab and said, that, look, now the Germans have this V2. We want you guys to do some research on uh, trying to understand the uh, uh, longer range ballistic missiles. Long range in those days being 100 miles, like a V2. The Corporal rocket was a uh, radio controlled, radio guided uh, rocket. It, it performed reasonably well, although the fact that it was a um, rehash of a research device meant that it was never really a very good production rocket. Uh, in the early days, the test was a success if the rocket engine didn't blow up, and, uh, and then if it was a success if the, if the missile got off the pad and went in the right general direction, and finally it was a success if it hit the target. Then the lab's mission changed again. Building on the missile supporting technology that they developed, Pickering and JPL, still under Army sponsorship, produced Explorer 1. And we, we indeed did quite a number of, several tests with, with von Braun's people in lobbing a reentry test vehicle about 3,000 miles out in the Atlantic. Uh, we realized that all we had to do was add another stage and we could have put that into orbit. That that uh, the Russians were hard at it. We thought the Russians were well ahead of the Vanguard program, and uh, if, if only we were given the go-ahead, we could do it. We were very disappointed when the first one was launched because we knew darn well that the um, Vanguard was uh, in trouble. The Secretary of Defense announced this morning that the Army is to participate in the International Geophysical Year Satellite Program. So we got, a, we, we got a report from uh, the Cape that the launch looks pretty good. And so the decision was made that we would make no public announcements uh, about the rocket until it had actually been picked up in California. And so we, we sat there for an hour and a half. Uh, the time came and went. <laughs> and uh, there was a period of uh, the period of eight minutes there, which were the longest eight minutes I've ever spent in my life. We were told that uh, there was going to be a press conference over at the National Academy of Sciences on the other side of the river. So off we went, and I remember sitting in that car with the three of us in the back seat. It was sort of a cold, rainy January night in Washington, and. Um, uh, I remember a conversation going along, I wonder whether anybody's going to be out here because it's about now about two o'clock in the morning, you see. The American space age had begun. The changes in mission were substantial, from rockets to missiles to spacecraft. The, the Army uh, operated us out of an office in the Pentagon, uh, Army Ordnance, and they gave us uh, pretty much a free hand to do what we wanted. In fact, uh, the budgeting processes with the Army usually were they would come out and say, well, how much money do you want this year? And that would be about it. Uh, well, when NASA appeared on the scene, 
Uh, one of the first things that happened was that the, the administrator of NASA, Keith Glennon, uh, and sat down with me and, and, and said, well, now, we're going to find out things are different. He said, now we're going to be working with a bunch of PhDs who came from, have come up through NACA and are very uh, sophisticated in, in technical areas. And they're going to be a lot more concerned with what's going on here, and they'll be a lot closer to us. Well, he was right. We had some discussions here at the lab as to where we belonged. There were quite a number of people here at the lab who wanted to get in the man in space program. But um, I elected to go to the deep space program and uh, discuss this with uh, uh, Glennon and Dryden, and they agreed. The long-range purpose of unmanned exploration of the planets is the development of technology which will lead to eventual manned exploration. Scientifically, our objective is to assist in answering two basic questions. What, if any, life forms exist on the planets, and how has the solar system been formed? There have been, in the past 21 years of JPL's history, many challenges and crises. At some points, the future seemed uncertain. The fact that we had gone through uh, this very tense period of, of losing ranges, of having uh, committees from the Congress and from, from uh, NASA come down, go over all of the things we were doing, uh, threats to cancel our contract and all this sort of thing, and then Ranger 7 succeeded. That was another highlight. Ten seconds to impact. Video still good. Excellent signal strength. The constant theme that carried through each of these shifts was preeminence, doing each job to the very limit of what was humanly possible. With this principle guiding them, Bill Pickering and the lab met the challenges one by one and were successful beyond any reasonable expectation. To his credit are the many accomplishments of explorer, pioneer, ranger, surveyor, mariner, and now Viking. Whatever our future successes, Bill Pickering's name will always be a central one in space exploration. You know, it seems to me that this last couple of weeks, I have been spending quite a large fraction of my time saying goodbye to you. And of course, it's been an opportunity to reflect on old times, to tell old stories, to embellish them appropriately, and generally to think about the laboratory and what we have done. But today, we want to look forward. This laboratory is a resource which I believe is on the borders of new triumphs, new successes, which will exceed even those of the past decades. And with these resources, you can do anything that you want to do. You can literally do anything.